Welcome to the Canadian Blind Hockey Podcast. Hello, blind hockey fans, and welcome to episode five of the Canadian Blind Hockey Podcast. I'm your host, Nico Cardarelli. Within the ever-growing blind hockey community, we have many talented athletes who have represented Canada at the highest levels in various parasports. In this week's episode, we feature four blind hockey players who have had the honor of representing Canada at the Paralympic Games in a variety of other sports, including tandem cycling, downhill skiing, and a pair of goalball athletes. While speaking of former Paralympians, let me introduce this week's co-host from the Vancouver Eclipse, Mark Bentz. Mark, welcome to the show. Good morning, Nico. Great to be here. Thanks for joining us. We're really excited to have you on board, and uh, I'm personally really excited to get into your Paralympic experience. But before we touch on your, um, you know, incredible times at the 1984 Games, I want to know, since you've been around the blind hockey community for such a long time, what does the growth of blind hockey over the last decade in particular mean to you? Well, it's going to realize the dreams for so many. And uh, this episode's about the Paralympics. And so to get to the Paralympics, and we hope pretty soon, but it will take a lot more hard work, it's going to bring all those people up to a level that is just, it's just so amazing to be a part of something. And when you represent your country, it's beautiful. And, and this community, it's already so tight, like with such a great group of players that it's going to be it's so awesome to see uh, our team get in the Paralympics and, of course, take home the gold. So <laughs> it definitely means everything because, of, as you say, it's been around a long time, and that's definitely something we're all focused on. You know, Mark, you've got such a vast experience within Canadian blind hockey from your role being a player on the ice to being a sponsor, a former board member, of course, you know, at the highest level in the organization at times, even volunteering as a coach and mentor with young kids at various events. Why is it important for you personally to give back so much to an organization like Canadian blind hockey? I think it just goes back to really, well, probably before losing my eyesight, but definitely when I started to lose my eyesight, you rely on a team. Like your quality of life depends on great people around you. Like every day, I depend on 15, 20 people for me just to have a good day. And so from the very beginning, it was obvious that you got to be a team player. And, and I, I had actually had that when I was much younger, but I realized when I started losing my eyesight at nine that the team is everything in life. And in blind hockey, I mean, that's why I love it so much. You are the team. From the moment you get there, you sit in that dressing room and it's such an awesome thing to engage in because every single person has to take part to score a goal or defend. And that's, that's what it is. Teamwork is everything in my life. Uh, that's a great point. Uh, really interesting perspective. Um, and, you know, it, it speaks to, I think, how tough things are right now because we can't be on the ice and in that familiar setting where, you know, you rely on that communication and teamwork. And obviously, with everything going on right now with the COVID-19 situation, it's, it's a difficult time right now for the community and not being able to host the Canadian National Blind Hockey Tournament and now kind of adapting the summer development camp for virtual sessions. Why are these programs, I think you've touched on it already, but why are they so important to the community? It's about the connection. And we see this as a nation. We certainly see this as a globe. People, humans need to connect. We are group individuals. And when you have a disability and a visual disability, which takes away so much of that, that connection that, that the average person just gets, um, being in contact with people, that's what's so powerful about 
our events is you're just hanging shoulder to shoulder with people and just experiencing life together. And so these online events, um, be it or not together in person, but virtually, we're still sharing the same experiences. And there's a lot of unique experiences that all disabilities have, but when you get a group of them together, you just, you learn, you grow, you connect. So it's all about the connection, Nico. Uh, that's a great point. Uh, now, again, Mark, you've had worn so many different hats within Canadian blind hockey. There's a professional question that I want to touch upon because uh, you're the founder and president of Electra Health a very important and key partner for Canadian blind hockey. And you've done incredible fundraising for the organization and even brought in new incredible partners, such as the Daniel family foundation from a professional side of things. And as a company, why is it important for you to give back and donate to this cause? Well, I, I got to take it back to that simple thing again. It's, it's really about the team, it's about the family, it's mm. about the connection. And that's how I built my business. Um, I built it because I wanted to bring amazing people around me and do great things in the community. And that's what blind ice, ice hockey is. Like Canadian blind ice hockey is just an amazing group of individuals from yourself, Luca, Matt, the board, as you say, the sponsors. And so to be a part of something that is so, it's just cool, you know, it's just mm. good. And uh, we're doing such progressive things that it's an essential part of life. Like for me, if I'm not growing in life and progressing, there's not a big purpose. I mean, that's how you really get bored and depressed in life. So growing and progressing is so important and therefore being a part of this community and having the impact it's had on myself and my family uh, mm. is just, I'm very grateful to participate. Well, we can't thank you personally enough. And, of course, Electra Health for helping to make blind hockey accessible to Canadians who are blind or partially sighted. Uh, Mark, to tee up the theme of the show, and it's one that you're no stranger of because we're discussing athletes who have participated at Paralympic Games and other sports. And I don't want to, you know, put it in perspective, but I, I guess I'm going to um unintentionally make you feel a little old here because you participated in the Innisbrook 1984 Winter Paralympic Games in Austria. I was born in August of 1984. So, <laughs> but again, you're in way better shape than I am. I've seen you on the ice. You could body check me into the boards and skate circles around me. So I, I don't want to talk too much trash here. Um, but take us back to those games to that experience what it felt for you to represent Canada and then to you know the moment where you have a gold medal put around your neck yeah it was awesome and definitely there have been a few decades uh, in between then and now but uh, back then I was the youngest athlete uh, to go to the Paralympics and they actually just put me on the team for experience mm -hmm. and they're like you know take Mark he needs to he needs to learn about the whole international platform and I was just I was only 16 at the time and so it was interesting because I really just didn't know anything I just loved skiing and, and I grew up skiing all my life with my friends then I joined uh, the provincial organization then the national then I got chosen to go to the Olympics and I just remember getting on the plane with the team and I was just like wow this is just again it's just cool like what a great life experience and and I got there and I was like, wow, now I'm in Austria, like in the Austrian Alps. And, and we were skiing, we, we arrived uh, 10 days before and we're doing all the training. And it was just a surreal moment to realize that I was only in grade 11. And I go back to when we actually, the, the race, the, the race where I won my first gold medal and it's in the downhill. And I just love the downhill, like going fast is, it, it was just everything to me. It's, it means a lot to me now too, but boy, as a young kid, it was, uh, it was pretty, uh, pretty important. And I remember being the starting gate and in downhill skiing, they do this countdown, they go 10 seconds and then it goes silent. And then the announcer comes on five, four, three, and he counts you down. And I remember taking off and I just was, 
I mean, I get goosebumps thinking about it right now. And what was amazing about our actual race is I ended up passing my guide, which is not a good idea in downhill skiing. You do not pass the guide. And I was like, oh my God, this is, this is win or lose. I'm going to crash or, or this is going to be pretty wild. And in the end, uh, my guide passed me before the finish line and we crossed and, and yeah, we, we won the gold medal. And, and it was just a, yeah, it was a pretty special thing. And uh, I just, again, so appreciative of the opportunity because for me, skiing was just so much fun. I didn't even think I'd go to the Paralympics and then to go to the Paralympics and then to win and then to have all that around you at the time when my eyesight was really going down. Like it, it wasn't a great time um, because I was 16 and really losing my eyesight. It was just extremely fun. And, uh, and I love uh, fun things like we all do. Well, that's uh, a pretty incredible and special experience for sure. Um, Mark, where is that medal now? I got to ask. I have it at my office. I got uh, photos and uh, yeah, two of the medals there. And then at our office, we treat other Olympic athletes. So we've got a whole wall uh, of photos. So I walk by it every day. Very cool. That's, uh, that's a very cool uh, way to, to pay homage to it. Um, you know, you kind of touched on the importance for you of skiing at the time, how it was fun. It kind of gave you, I guess, a bit of an escape. Can you tell us a little bit more about the para sport of skiing and, um, you know, what maybe you did to train or how it, you know, helped you develop as an athlete and a person? Yeah, it, it was, um, not a very simple training program, really. So from the age of probably eight, I would go up to Grouse and we started going with our parents. But quickly, maybe 10, uh, we would just go up our friends and we would just get to the top of the run and the first one down one. And if you didn't uh, place first, you were just basically ridiculed all the way up the chairlift. And just like young boys do, they're very relentless and uh, very competitive. So I had a very simple training program. Uh, I followed back in the day, there were a group of guys called the Crazy Canucks, mm -hmm. uh, and they were downhill skiers on the um, uh, world circuit. And my guy was Steve Paborski. And I just remember every time getting to the top of the run and I would just completely embody Steve Paborski. And what was fun is I would beat my friends down the run and they would get so upset that uh, I beat him because of course I, you know, I'm visually impaired. Uh, but that's where I really learned my ability and fearlessness to just put my loss of vision aside. And when I'm with my friends, even today, it's just, I'm not blind, I'm just another guy. And so back then I didn't grow up within that training model. And that was my real edge. Because as soon as I started downhill skiing competitively, people couldn't believe how I did ski. And, and I believe it's because I just had to chase my friends uh, down the hill every weekend. And we went Friday night, all day Saturday, Saturday night, all day Sunday, uh, Christmases, uh, spring break, everything. Like we just, that's all we did for years. So that was a simple training program and uh, pretty effective. Uh, Mark, final question for you before we get really into the thick of today's episode and tee up some of the guests. Uh, the Canadian Sport for Life policy preaches the importance of multi-sport experience, especially for young athletes to develop well-rounded physical and mental skills. You yourself are a multi-sport athlete. What other pair of sports have you tried and why do you think it's important for athletes who are blind to try multiple sports, even if it's just cross training for their blind hockey experiences? Well, like any athlete, you know, Paralympian or, or you know, Olympian or just the, the guy down the street, cross training gives you the ability, certainly from a neuromuscular perspective, to adapt. And in sport, adaptation is the key. So you want to get out there and you want to see, hey, how can I benefit? And typically people have a primary sport, but doing those other sports, how does it benefit little components of that primary sport? 
So I've done tandem cycling, uh, which is incredible endurance. Like, my God, I mean, you're out there for an hour hard. So I, I love that. Uh, I did go ball. Wow, like go ball. Uh, I didn't appreciate it till I strapped on some pads and got to the got on the floor with some uh, higher level players, and that is a workout. Uh, and that, I tried golf. Uh, that was interesting for focus. So what was cool about that is you had to really train your brain to just sort of deliver at one moment. And so I love that. So yeah, no cross training, it, it's essential. And uh, I mean, even take it out of sport, just get out there and do a variety of things. The more you do, the better you're going to learn and the better you'll adapt to everything. Like great example, COVID, you know, the more experiences you have, you're going to adapt in this situation better. If you're just using one thing in your life, it's very hard to be resilient. Resilient comes from a variety of experiences. Uh, we're really excited to have Mark Bentz co-hosting for today's show, and we do have a great show on tap for today. As we're going to chat with different blind hockey players who have also been to the Paralympics in a variety of sports. So ahead, we have interviews, Mark, with one of your Vancouver Eclipse teammates, Brian Cowie. We'll then chat with Kerry Anton from the Edmonton Seahawks, followed by former Canadian National Blind Hockey Team member Bruno Hache from Le Bou de Montréal. So with all that being said, let's get this show on the road, as after this short break, we'll catch up with Brian Cowie. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. We're now very excited to be joined by Brian Cowie from the Vancouver Eclipse. Brian, welcome to the show and thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks a lot for having me, Nico. Absolutely. We're excited to speak with you today because you're such an accomplished athlete and you've got such a diverse experience in your sporting career. Um, but I really want to start a little bit with your experience in tandem cycling, because uh, not only are you a member of the Canadian blind hockey community, but you're a high level cyclist. So can you tell us a little bit about how the sport of tandem cycling works? Well, uh, of course I'm visually impaired, so you don't want me controlling a bike. So uh, in tandem cycling, we have a fully sighted, what they call pilot who um, steers, uh, makes decisions in races and I'm on the back like the other what we call they're called stokers and we uh as they say just supply some power to the to the machine and um it's a fully uh Paralympic sport it has been for these maybe 25 years now um and I got started back in the mid 90s I sort of stumbled across it and, you know, we'll touch on your Paralympic experience shortly because, um, you know, you've participated, you represented Canada at three Paralympic Games. Um, but just to expand on a little bit about that relationship between, uh, you know, yourself and your pilots, um, can you just tell us a little bit about, you know, maybe what's going on during a race, how much communication there is, um, and, and, you know, why that... Um, I guess connection between your pilot and yourself is so crucial. I think the communication level varies from team to team. Um, and I can't speak to how everybody felt on the bike, but for me, um, I think I had a really good feel for the race. Um, I could feel when things were going to accelerate. I could feel when we could take a break. Um, I could feel, um, the pressure on the pedals when my my pilot was going to uh, need some extra juice. Um, others, I think, had to communicate a lot more verbally. But I think that after I rode with a pilot for a little while, I could feel what they needed. I could feel their um, style. So mine was not, I don't think, as verbal. We used to use the odd uh, just hand tap because my handlebars are very close to their, their legs. Okay. 
So often, rather than yell something and then everybody else knows what you're going to do, mm. we would uh, just have a hand tap. If I tap you with my right hand, we're going to do this. If I tap you with my left hand, we're going to do something different. So, you know, the things in between, we we're just winging, but those were a couple of, uh, couple of standard things we used to do. Hmm. That's very interesting. And I guess I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, you're right. You don't just want to yell out strategy in the middle of the race because then you're just tipping your hand to the rest of the field. So that's interesting. The nonverbal communication. Yeah. And especially with tandems because they take, they're kind of like a big truck. They don't accelerate like a Ferrari. They mm. accelerate like a 40 footer. Okay. So the thing is it's a lot of it was, was the, uh, the surprise aspect if you could get that little jump often they couldn't get on your wheel and that could be uh the uh a change in the whole race strategy so you kind of had to try to figure out a way to do it quietly hmm. that's very very interesting uh brian you know we alluded to it a little bit earlier that you have represented canada at three paralympic games sydney 2000 athens 2004 and beijing 2008 which paralympic games to you was the most special maybe which one stands out to you the most and why well um for a couple of reasons, but I think most people would say their first one. And for me, it is my first one. The Athens one was, or I shouldn't say Athens, I should say Sydney, was the most special because, I mean, when I started, my, you might say my sporting life, I never expected to be doing something like that. Huh. My first thing was I wanted to complete a small triathlon and not die and I would have been happy. So that progression to, to the Paralympic games was kind of like amazing. And, and then the way the, uh, the people in, in Sydney um, react to amateur sport is it's phenomenal. Um, when we went to the opening, the opening ceremonies, everyone corrals, as they say, underneath the stadium and you can't really hear anything. And as you get closer to the entrance way, you start to hear this kind of a rumble. And we're looking at each other like, well, what's that noise? Like, you know, and then you go through the, go through the runway and there's 120,000 people in the stands just going crazy. Like I'd never seen anything like that before. Uh -huh. And just the way they, they treated us for the two weeks we were there. Um, it was like, for me, it was jaw dropping. I just was like, I, I couldn't believe it. I'll just tell you one quick story. We were in the stands yeah. at the velodrome and my family had come and my youngest son was, um, he would have been 14 at the time and he's kind of hanging around with me. I'm up in the stands with the family and there's a, there's a woman comes and sits beside me and she just sitting there patiently. She has a paper in her hand and my son is looking at her and she's not interrupting. She's wait till I finish. And then <clears throat> she says to me, uh, could I have your autograph? And my son looks at her and goes, Hey, it's just my dad. <laughs> <laughs> Like maybe you got the wrong guy here, but uh, <laughs> but that's the way they treated us. It was like uh, you went from a nobody mm. to like a rock star over there. That's really cool. That's um, you know I've never had an opportunity like that to experience something like that. I think very few people ever get that opportunity. So that's uh, that's pretty cool. That you know you still have those vivid memories and those special moments like that one you just shared with us. So that's uh, I can definitely understand why that games in Sydney was uh, maybe your most memorable. And obviously it was a memorable one for the nation as well because you know I think we were all kind of captivated when Simon Whitfield took the gold in the triathlon. And Brian, you yourself have competed. Uh, not only in just cycling, but you've also done over a dozen Ironman races. So for anyone that's maybe unaware, what does Ironman consist of? And I got to think there are not that many partially sighted Ironman competitors out there. Uh, probably more than you think, but uh, not, not, there's not, there's not, uh, there's not hundreds. Um, so it's, it's this, if you know triathlon, it's a swim, bike, run. Mm -hmm. And there's different distances for different uh, events. But the Ironman is, um, a, I'll give it to you in kilometers and in miles. It's a four-kilometer 
2.4 mile swim, and then a 180 kilometer or 112 mile bike, and then a 42 kilometer or 26 mile full marathon, one after the other. I'm exhausted just hearing about that. <laughs> On the same day. <laughs> I couldn't do all of that in a year, <laughs> let alone the same day. <laughs> You'd be surprised. I didn't think I could do it either before I ventured into it. You know, what, I guess, you know, being a multi-sport athlete, how does the intensity of competing in Ironman help you in those tough moments when you're on the ice playing blind hockey? Well, they say when you, it doesn't matter who you are when you finish an Ironman, you're a different person. Oh. And um, uh, I, I have to agree with that. It's, you know, if, if, if I can work hard for 10, 11, 12 hours in the, in the Ironman race, I think I can work hard for 45 seconds to a minute in a hockey ship. You know, I'm curious because obviously there would have been a ton of, training and dedication and effort time sacrifice everything put into um you know achieving what you've done and being a three-time paralympian again completing over a dozen ironman races um i guess i'm curious what are you more proud of are you more proud of your uh, paralympic accomplishments or the fact that you've you know completed an ironman multiple ironmans which you know, very few people really, I think, even do to begin with. So, it, I mean, they're both incredible feats, but I guess what resonates more with you? Well, uh, they're, it's, it's hard to, to differ between the two, but, I mean, uh, I'll say one of my proudest moments was two years before the Paralympics when I did my first international race in Europe and the coach came into the room and he threw my jersey to me on the bed and to get that jersey with the maple leaf on it and know that this is you're at the top right you're on the national team um, there's not a there's not another group above you you guys are the ones that are wearing the flag you're wearing the maple leaf you're the one that's representing the country that was um that was one of my biggest biggest days that one but but the Paralympics is like, again, I never, I, I never started yeah. with that aspiration. I, it, it just would never entered my mind and it just sort of gradually got closer and closer. And then, then I was walking out the tunnel in, in Sydney to 120,000 screaming people. And it was just, uh, it was unreal. Well, that's very cool. Well, switching gears a little bit, uh, because you've obviously been successful and competed at the highest level in some pretty intense individual sports, uh, and clearly you've got an, uh, a love for endurance training and high-level competition. When did you first hear about blind hockey? How did you get involved, and what do you love about participating in a sport that consists of being on a team? It was back in the, maybe the mid nineties. Um, uh, the news broadcast was coming on and they always have, you know, they always have the little teasers before. Mm -hmm. And one of the teasers was, and I was involved in, um, in uh, tandem cycling already, but not at the international level, just locally. And um, I just heard other, I just heard on the news that they were going to something about blind hockey. And I go, I gotta see this. Like, so I, I turned on and watched it, and it was a, maybe 10 guys, hardly any equipment, you know, and they're skating around. And then I, uh, so I knew some of the people involved, so I had to make a phone call right away because I had never played hockey when I was younger. It just wasn't, you know, in the cards for us when we were, when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. So um, I had learned how to skate on the Friday, the Friday evening skate, so I could, I knew I could skate. So I had to, I made a few calls and, um, and then I was hooked because while I love the, uh, individual part of the triathlon and the cycling, because it is up to you. I love having teammates depend on you doing your job and 
working with the working with the group and winning with the group or losing with the group. I don't mind. I just I'd like to just compete with with the group and my teammates and and do my job and do the best I can to help us do the best that we can. You know, Brian, I'm curious, what are your top three favorite blind hockey experiences or memories so far in your career? Ooh, top three. Uh, well, I, I would think that um, our first national tournament, uh-huh. I don't even remember how I did, but just the fact that we had a national tournament and got together with all the, because we had never played with anybody else other than just our local guys. Right. So it was great to, to get together with them. And it's, it's for me, it's, it's a whole different experience when you get into a group of people like you, you know, that are visually impaired or, you know, it's just, they, it's kind of like, Part of my life is explaining what it's like uh-huh. or what my situation is. But when you get into that group, you don't have to explain. They're all, they're, they're all different, but we're all in the same position, you know? Yeah. And it just was, it just was great. That was, so that might've been one of my best ones. Huh. My other, my, maybe my second one was um, when we won the, uh, the gold medal at the, uh, the last, um, the tournament where we had uh, Canada, East Canada, West and the U.S. Yes, team in that's the right. Tournament. Yep. That was the best blind hockey game I've ever been in. Mm. I mean, it was so fast and there's so many skilled guys on there. Not me. <laughs> but it was fun. And I, I love to play on Fridays when we play. But I love to play when there's something on the line. There's nothing like that. I mean, I will say when there's something on the line, I'm sometimes not the nicest guy. But I warn them before they drop the puck. <laughs> well, it's funny Anything you that say happens, that. <laughs> nothing is personal, I say. <laughs> It's funny you say that because uh, obviously our co-host for today's episode is one of your Vancouver Eclipse teammates, Mark Bentz. And uh, I think at some point he alludes to the fact that you guys have um, a bit of communication between yourselves and how you always like to deliver a certain line when he asks who's there as you guys line up for face off. So <laughs> yeah, he, he'll say who's this and I'll say it's your worst nightmare. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Uh, You know, Brian, I'm curious because cycling is obviously a great sport in terms of training your lower body, increasing your muscular uh, definition in your legs and building up that lower body strength, which, you know, as you know, as a hockey player is really crucial in terms of good skating. Um, So how does it help? How does cycling help you get in shape for the blind hockey season? And would you recommend that other players get involved with cycling as a potential cross training opportunity? Well, it is a great cross training for, uh, and it is great cross training for, for hockey. I mean, there was, um, I can, I can drop a name and you, no one's going to know who this is, Hmm. but in the eighties, there was a um, Olympic speed skater named Eric Hyden. And when Eric Hyden wasn't competing in high-level speed skating, Eric Hyden was riding a bike professionally in Europe. And there was many times uh, the pilots from European teams were speed skaters in, the, in their other life. So the crossover is... Um, is important and and also the fact that if you can um visually or visually impaired if you have a stationary trainer in your house you don't have to go outside and ride you can ride inside i do most of my training inside now Uh on the bike so it's 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 one of the best that i can think of um that goes head to head with with skating 
You know, Brian, uh, we can't thank you enough for joining us here today. We're chatting with Brian Cowie, a three-time Paralympian, a member of the Canadian blind hockey community. Um, but Brian, you have such an accomplished uh, career in sports. You're part of the Burnaby Sports Hall of Fame, and you serve many years as the president of BC Blind Sports. So I'm curious, in your opinion, how have blind sports and sports for athletes with a disability in general grown over your lengthy career? Well, I think when I started, we didn't exist. <laughs> you know, you never saw anything uh, on television about, um, well, I hate the word disability, but about disability sports. Um, I tend to think I don't have a disability. I have an inconvenience. Hmm. So my vision causes me some inconveniences in my life, but I'm not disabled. Um, but no, it's, uh, it's a big difference. Um, I mean, just for example, I mean, when we went to Sydney, it was like the way they treated us was crazy. And, and, and to see how the Paralympics were, were uh, received here uh, when the Olympics were here in 2010, they had, um, uh, a lot of attendance at their events, which that that wouldn't have been 20 years ago or 30 years ago. It's um, well, the Olympics, I guess, were 10 years ago already. Uh, but it's it's uh, it's 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 a lot, a lot better than it was. You know, it's still going to get better still, but it's a lot better than it was. Like, how often do you turn on TSN and there's a sledge hockey tournament on? That wasn't on 20 years ago. Yeah. And there's going to be a blind hockey tournament on pretty soon, too. Yeah, you know, it's a great I don't point. know when, but soon. <laughs> no, no, and you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, I know for a fact firsthand that network people at TSN and Sportsnet are aware of blind hockey. They have watched footage of blind hockey games. And I do think you're right. It's only a matter of time and maybe certain partnerships or certain benchmarks being achieved, but it really is only a matter of time before we start seeing blind hockey competitions as well, getting showcased on networks like TSN or Sportsnet, or, you know, even in some of the cases south of the border as well. Um, Brian, on that note, you've seen the growth in blind hockey, in particular over the last decade. And having been to a Paralympic, multiple Paralympic Games and representing this country, I'm curious on your thoughts on if blind hockey is on the right path to gain Paralympic inclusion and what needs to be done to ensure that that goal is achieved. Well, I think to go from um, beginnings to being in the games, there's a few steps and some of those steps are bigger than others. Mm -hmm. I think right now they're at one of those bigger steps. They've got a foundation in Canada and the US and a little taste in Europe, but they need to make that next step because they need to get about another six countries on board um, so they can uh, actually have a world championship and then submit to the Paralympics. But right. they're, they're, they're on the right track. It's gonna happen. It's gonna happen for sure. Uh, the Winter Paralympics is, um, I might say short of events, they could use some more events. And blind hockey is perfect. It's, a, it's fast, it's skilled, it's exciting to watch. Um, it's gonna happen, I, I know for sure. I'm... Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I completely agree with you. I think it's, as you identified, there's certain uh, benchmarks, certain levels of competitions that you, you know, have to be able to host to show that there's enough strong competition globally that, you know, there is a quality of field there to be able to include it in the Paralympics. But I, you know, I, I think you're spot on the quality of play, the speed of the game. And I, again, we mentioned this with one of our other guests. I think the biggest um, boost that maybe blind hockey has is that if you walked into a rink and couldn't hear the clanging of the puck, if you only had the visuals, you wouldn't know it's an adaptive form of hockey. You would think it's just a really fast-paced, high-level hockey game until you realize that the nets are a foot shorter and that the puck is slightly larger and that the referees aren't using a whistle. They're using a buzzer. 
outside of those adaptations, you would never know that blind the, the players participating are blind or partially sighted. And I think for the average sports fan or hockey fan, the fact that blind hockey visually most resembles able-bodied hockey, traditional hockey, is such a positive factor. And I think that really will help um, gain Paralympic inclusion one day. Well, when, when people watch a Paralympic sport, um, I think they're all somewhat amazed as to what these athletes with a disability can do. Hmm. When someone watches a blind hockey game and they know they're going to a blind hockey game, they're going to have some, some thoughts in their mind about what it's going to be like, just like I did when I first watched it on the news. Yep. But when they get to the rink and they watch that, I, their first statement is they're going to look at whoever they're with and go, these people are blind. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's amazing what some of those guys can do, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think of that game you alluded to as one of your top memories that Canada East Canada West final from a couple of years ago, that's maybe the best blind hockey game I've ever called. As you said, it was so fast paced. It was uh, kind of edge of your seat, nail biter, went into overtime. It had all the makings of an instant classic. Um, and, and, you know, I think about that, kind of experience and if people witness that they, as you say there's no way they're thinking these people you know the the players are visually impaired or are dealing with a disability you see that level yeah. of play and you just think this is world-class hockey so uh, it's it's pretty incredible for sure take that video send it to the international paralympic committee and oh. say this is the sport we would like to introduce to your winter paralympic games and I think I that would be a pretty good can, case right there. I don't know how they can say, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, Brian, you're a pretty fun guy. So before we let you go, I want to do a bit of a rapid fire segment with you if you're up for that. Sure. Awesome. Okay. I still have some cognitive skills. I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So my first question for you, uh, what is actually, okay. First question. Which of the three Paralympic Games did you eat the best meals at? Oh, wow. I'm a foodie. Um, I've got to know. I'll say, I'll, I'll say uh, Sydney. They're all good because there's food from everywhere around the world. Even McDonald's is in there. Oh, see, now that's surprising to me that Sydney would have better eats than Athens. I thought for sure, like, Athens would have been the pick there. But that's interesting. Okay. Uh, okay. Partly because it was the first one, and I've never gone into a place, a tent that big with so much food and just whatever you want, and it's just, so I, it, it has a, a little bit of a special place in my heart. Fair enough, that makes sense. Uh, okay, in terms of Ironman competitions, which was the toughest race that you completed? Oh, the toughest one. You mean the one that hurt the most? Yes, yeah. I thought you were just physically so happy you were done with it. Oh, every one. But, <laughs> um, every one, I said, just get me to the end of this, and I promise I'll never do another one. Um, <laughs> maybe the first one, just because I didn't know for sure if I could do it. You know? mm -hmm. and, and the other is Hawaii. It is so hot. And like the pavement is like a 120 degrees Fahrenheit. It's, wow. it's, um, and you've got the best of the best there because everyone has to qualify and you're running along and there's this 2% fat body fat athlete laying on the side of the road, throwing up and you're going, Oh, this is only going to get worse. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's, uh, yeah, that, that would be daunting to, to run by somebody that fit and you see that they're, they're struggling to complete it. Yeah. <laughs> like, why am I still up? This is maybe 10 more steps. I'll be like him, but. <laughs> uh, okay. I'm curious, which of the three do you like least running, cycling or swimming? Oh, 
that's changed. It, it used to be the running. I hated the running <laughs> and I liked the swimming. But um, when you get to a certain level of running, it is so, it is so relaxing hmm. to just run and, but it hurts. But I think, oh, maybe the running is the worst. <laughs> <laughs> I can appreciate because it's that. near the end, you know. The swimming, I'm fresh; it doesn't have any effect on me. But the running is painful. You know, you've got all this incredible hardware behind you, so I'd be remiss if I didn't ask: What is the medal or trophy that you are most proud of winning over your career? Oh, probably my first. Uh, podium at the world championships in 98 I was surprised to get that so maybe that one silver medal in the time trial at the world championships and as my nickname became after that the second fastest man in the world <laughs> 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 so that um, maybe that one you know they all have they all like my first Ironman medal was also amazing because I never thought I would ever do that. I used to watch it on TV and think, no, that's not, I can't do that. Uh, okay. Who are your favorite line mates to play with? And you can go outside of the eclipse for this one. So anybody in the oh. community. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, <clears throat> that's um, not easy. Uh, Wow, I, you know, I, I like playing with 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 Anthony Chula. He's a local guy. I like playing with Anthony, and um, that is such a oh. I wish see if you had sent me the questions, I'd have an answer for you. <laughs> um, but I, I'm, I mean, I'd like you know what? I, I love playing with guys I've never played with before. Actually, okay. When we go to the tournament and I'm with new guys I've never played with, I like that. I love that. That's pretty cool. Um, trying to think of another couple of good ones here before we wrap it up. Uh, okay, what do you get more satisfaction out of? Setting up a goal or scoring a goal? Um, you know, if it's, if it's a nice play, um, my philosophy when I play is twofold, is to help my team win which if I help by, by setting up a goal and not to be, when my line is on, not to be scored on. So I think with that philosophy, I have to say um, setting up a, a nice goal to my teammate, I would prefer. Brian, uh, we can't thank you enough for taking time to join us here today. Um, one final thought before we say goodbye, because, you know, you've seen the sport of blind hockey grow so much over the past decade. Where do you envision the sport going in the next decade? In the next decade? Um, when's the next Paralympic Games? 2022? 20, 20, yes, that's right, 2022. 2022, 2026. 20, uh, you know, they may be in the Paralympic Games by then. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a lot. They're, they're at that big step. They're going to take that big step you know, and, and once they take that big step and get um, Europe on board, I think uh, the, the, the hill will flatten out a little, the curve will flatten out a little bit. Um, but I think, I think they could be in the Paralympic in the next 10 years. It's, there's, there's, there's nothing, nothing negative about that sport, you know, that, that I don't see any, anything that holds them back, like uh, the venue they need to play in or, you know, the adaptation. I don't right. think, see anything that's holding them back other than just make, taking those, those steps they need to take. Well, it's certainly going to be an exciting path ahead for the sport of blind hockey. And uh, Brian, we want to thank you for everything you've done as a member of the blind hockey community. And once again, uh, thank you for your time today and congratulate you on all your accomplishments across the various sports in which you've participated at the highest levels. Uh, Brian Cowie from the Vancouver Eclipse, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a real pleasure chatting with you. 
Well, thank you, Nico. I've, uh, I've, I've really enjoyed it. And uh, we're going to keep working. I'll do whatever I can at my end. And uh, they'll be in the Paralympics soon. Well, great to hear from Brian Cowie of the Vancouver Eclipse. Mark, you and Brian are longtime friends and teammates with the Eclipse. Can you speak to his level of competition as a high-performance athlete and maybe share a bit of an insight about your guys' friendship? Yeah, Brian, that guy's intense, let me tell you. Uh, I mean, he's a world-class athlete. And just recently, uh, he was training for the Penticton Ironman, which he's done before. And of course, COVID, he can't do that now. But I think he just posted he's on his 100th day of straight training. So that tells you how focused and how dedicated and disciplined that guy is. And uh, I love being around him because one, well, he's a, a senior uh, team member, uh, so above 50 uh, in that group. And so we connect definitely on that level and just life experiences. But I always have uh, this moment where we get on the ice and I can't see with my vision. I can't tell who people are. I can tell that they're there, but I line up and I always say, hey, who's that? And Brian, I know it's Brian, because he says to me, he goes, your worst nightmare. And <laughs> I always chuckle. But it, it says a lot. Like, that, that statement is so serious. Because, boy, when that puck drops, man, Brian is all business. And uh, it's just fun. Just great to be around that guy. And I can't wait to get out on the ice with him. Yeah, we're all looking forward to getting back on the ice once it's safe and possible. Um, well, coming up next after the short break, it's one of my favorite segments of the show. It's the player profile segment. So stay tuned. Now it's time for one of my favorite segments of the show, the Canadian Blind Hockey Podcast Player Profile. During this player profile segment, we'll be sharing your blind hockey testimonials. Each week, we'll feature a different player from the community. And this episode's player profile features Brayden Lyons from the W. Ross McDonald School for the Blind. My name is Braden Lyons, and I've been part of Blind Hockey for two years. Blind Hockey is one of my favorite sports. I have always wanted to play hockey, and I wasn't able to. I never thought I'd have the opportunity to play hockey, or even knew it existed, until it was introduced to me at my school, W. Ross McDonald in Brantford. Some of the other blind sports that I participate in are goalball and blind soccer. Blind hockey has become such a big part of my life, and I will continue to play hockey. A big thank you to Braden for sharing your love of blind hockey. We're putting a call out there to all blind hockey players to share your blind hockey testimonial with a chance to hear your very own story here on the Canadian Blind Hockey Podcast. Email your testimonial to info at blindicehockey.com. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. I'm now very excited to be joined by Carrie Anton, who's a Paralympic gold medalist in the sport of goalball. And Carrie is also a member of the Edmonton Seahawks blind hockey team. Carrie, welcome to the show. Thank you, Nico. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, we're really excited to chat with you about, you know, your experiences as a multi-sport athlete. And I really want to start with um, goalball specifically, because I think most um, people who have watched Paralympic events are familiar with goalball. But I do think that sports fans in general maybe aren't as uh, knowledgeable about the sport. So I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about the sport and maybe explain it just a little bit to our viewers. Sure. 
So goalball is a sport that's called um, an extreme sport for the blind. It's just played by people who are blind or partially sighted and sighted folks are the officials and referees and such. So the idea is that it's played on a gymnasium floor, nine meters by 18 meters. And there's three people on one team, three on the opposite team on the other side of the um, 18 meters. You take a ball the size of a basketball, feels like a basketball, it has bells inside, and you whip this ball really fast, really hard at each other, and you dive on the floor trying to block the ball from going in the goal behind the three of you, which is a nine meter goal, and that's why it needs three people to defend it. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just a fantastic sport. There's penalties, there's uh, team penalties, personal penalties. Um, there's sections of the court where the ball can't go outside of or the stoppage in play, and then the officials have to throw it in. Um, the goal is that nine meters and about shoulder height. So I forget the exact dimensions, but I'm five foot four. So it's about five foot, maybe. Yeah. Um, just a fantastic sport. Lots of communication, lots of court orientation, um, yes. knowing your spatial, where you're going. And then also the athleticism. Get up, get down, get up, get down, get up, get down. It's just, you know, really fantastic. And, and we've seen the sport evolve, um, you know, from like 70 countries um, to now there's hundreds, hundreds of countries that play and only, you know, 12, eight or 12 get into the Paralympic Games, depending if it's men or women, right? Um, and the key part is that everyone is blindfolded, so nobody can see what's going on on the court. And that's why the communication, the court orientation, spatial experience is so important. You know, you mentioned it's classified as an extreme sport for the blind. And, uh, you know, having done a little bit of play-by-play -play for goalball in the past, um, I can totally appreciate why it would be classified that way. Because that ball, I got to think blocking it leaves a couple of bruises. So um, can you, you know, I think you kind of mentioned the up-down aspect, which our goaltenders in blind hockey can certainly appreciate. But um, blocking that goal ball, yeah, I got to think it takes a special kind of person to know that you're going to take some welts in that sport. <laughs> Totally. Um, I'm, you know, it's about three pounds. And so when that ball's coming at you at 88 kilometers an hour, which is like 0.7 of a re second reaction time from when the person releases it to when it goes across the court and hits you, um, you really have to contract your body so that when it hits you, it's just like muscle against hard rubber. And, and it does leave welts. I mean, you, hit your head on the posts, you get your fingers get kicked by a teammate. I mean, there's just so many things that can happen in the sport, but that what makes it extreme is that athleticism that's needed because as soon as you block this ball, you're basically in a side laying plank position on the ground. You get up, you take three to five running steps and you whip that ball at your opponent again. So it's just this constant cycle of offense, defense, offense, defense. Yeah, and it, it is hard on the body. Um, when I played uh, for 20 years, I played. I was on the national team for eight. And um, we would go from a standing, almost like ready volleyball type position and dive on the floor like that. And so imagine doing that 90 times in a game. Wow. And you do that for 20 years. You know, my hips remember very well. <laughs> I think the <laughs> bruises are still there from when I'd land on my elbow, my shoulder, and my hips, right? And then we wear pads. You know, we wear... Um, pads with padding on the side and knee pads and elbow pads and nowadays folks wear mouth guards because of the risk of concussion and mouth injuries when you get hit in the face with the ball if you're not in the right position yeah quite a physical yeah. sport yeah. yeah because you're not wearing a helmet out there right like you mentioned you've got certain padding but your your head is is pretty exposed if you're not you know tracking the ball properly or if you're miss you're not in the right position and like you said at that elite level there's such a small window of time to react you really have to uh, focus on every single detail with every single play yeah totally when I coach new players the first thing I say is you you tilt your head backwards and you put your top arm in front of your face like in front of your straight arm in front of your face and that will protect your head that top arm will always protect your face yeah well, uh, I've been coaxed into trying blind <laughs> hockey as a goaltender. I don't know if I'll ever get the courage to try goalball, but hey, maybe one day. Um, but, you know, I want to focus on your career at that elite level because, Carrie, you made it to the pinnacle of the sport 
in the Sydney 2000 Paralympic Games. And not only did you represent Canada, you won a gold medal at that competition. So can you tell us a little bit about your Paralympic experience? It was a fantastic rise in every way. Um, in 1997, a lot of us got selected to the team newly. Um, so you have six of the best players in the country coming together. We were adversaries before, but we had to learn to play nice, right? And play together and share and do all these things. And we went to the 1998 World Championships and we came in like last. We sucked really badly. And um, But um, as... As teammates, we had half French and half English, so we had to learn language. We're, um, coaches, again, French and English, so we had to really become this multilingual team that was able to be multifaceted and understand each other, communicate well on the court. And um, when we went to the qualifier in Finland um, to, go, to get to go to Sydney, um, we won that tournament and we just kept winning. And that probably was more exciting because we knew – you know, just a year before, we were really, really bad, right? And yeah. so we, it was a fantastic jiving of people. And so when we got to Sydney, no one saw us coming. You know, we were, who are they, Canada? And uh, we ended up tying or winning games all the way along, like two to one, one to zero, one, one, two. It was just all the way along. And even the final gold medal game, um, one of my teammates, the late Nancy Moran, she scored the goal within final seconds of the game. And that's what won the gold medal for us. And people were like, yeah, Canada comes from nowhere. Um, it was just fantastic. It still gives me chills. I just, I love telling that story of how we, in just a few years, we became a team. We became that sisterhood of, you know, comp confidants, trusted alliances, and, and we, we, did, we did great. And we held that for a very long time. That's a very incredible story and, and you know, rise to journey and, and uh, all of that. That's, that's very special. And, you know, I'm just wondering what it would have meant for you as a person, as an athlete, that moment where you're standing on the podium, you're hearing, oh, Canada at the Paralympic Games and you're getting the gold medal put around your neck. Take me through that moment. Well, we walked in and we walk around the arena and they're playing this, I forget the name of the song, the doo -doo 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 -doo, and you, you come in and then we're standing there and you walk up onto this platform and all six of us had a spot to stand on and O Canada played and the, the facility, a stadium just was roaring for us. Everyone was cheering for us. It was so fantastic. My heart was exploding. That moment, um, they let us stand on the podium for a very long time afterwards just to soak it all in. It was absolutely beautiful. And we're like, should we get off? Should we get off? And they're like, no, stay. <laughs> we're like, okay. <laughs> um, and just to be there with my friends was um, knowing that we all had, you know, People went through injuries. Um, I myself had some injuries and stuff throughout that whole journey to get to the Paralympic Games, to that gold medal podium. Um, we all sacrificed. We had no funding. Um, just fantastic um, experience that I still wear the ring today, you know, mm. that we got from the, uh, I got from my province. Um, it's just that such a part of me um, that it, it's hard to not identify with it sometimes. Yeah, of yeah. course. Yeah. You know, yeah. we see the boomerangs up on the wall behind you. You just showed us the ring. Do you still have the gold medal from those games? And if you do, where is it? Oh, yes, we still have it. It's um, right now it's in its case mm -hmm. in a backpack by the door. <laughs> 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 we still, you know, get a lot of asks to do some school visits or people want to see it and uh sure. so the you know the gold is sort of coming off in places and uh i checked into getting it re-golded you know because it is uh it's it's nickel that's got gold plating around gold plating, it right. yeah yeah it's so <laughs> like well it's kind of getting worn but you know but i i love it and we take it everywhere we definitely don't hide it it's canada's mm -hmm. medal so i just love sharing it with the people who who supported us yeah well, that's very cool and, and very special. And uh, if people at the COC are listening, yeah, let's get that replated for Carrie. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so, Carrie, we've talked a little bit about the high performance uh, aspect of your career, but you've also volunteered as a goalball coach 
and are a strong proponent for recreational programs as well. So why is it important for individuals who are blind or partially sighted, in your opinion, to try out multiple sports? Well, I was one of those kids that didn't discover goalball till I was like 19. Uh, my family played baseball and sort of did shinny and things like that. So I had exposure, but I didn't really have that the physical literacy that was needed. So I, this is why I think it's important that all people who, at all ages need to stay physically active and learn new skills so that they can be healthier as they get older um, and be able to try different sports. And so the one way to do that is to, as a kid, you know, do shinny, play softball at whatever level you can, play volleyball, at least learn the skill of bumping a ball, right? Or, or serving a ball or running on a track, right? It's not that you're going to maybe jump over hurdles or something, but you're going to have the concept of what the body's doing. So then later you can do lunges and things like that. So I think it's so important. And this is why I got involved in sport after I retired on the recreation level, because a lot of times that's where we're introducing sport to kids mm. and also to people who haven't been in sport. I mean, I, I can, countless people I can, can tell you about that are in their twenties and thirties and they still don't really understand what it's like when I say, okay, throw that ball overhand. Mm. Right. Um, that just isn't a skill that they ever learned. And I think it's a shame. And, you know, for me um, and the folks with, um, you know, blind hockey can attest to this. I've been playing hockey since the 90s, but it's not like I'm getting better, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. I don't know about I'm, that, Mary. <laughs> I'm, one of those, I'm one of those one sport people, right? Goalball is my thing, and I'm very good at it. Even today, if I still get on the court with, um, you know, the, some of the te team players here, I still whip that ball pretty fast. I'm still pretty good. So it's just that's my sport, and that's a sport that I really learned well but sure. not really any other sport. And I think that's a, that's a shame. So yeah, sometimes I, I look like a puppy dog trying to jump on a sofa when I do a box jump. It's just <laughs> stuttering. <laughs> no, yeah. but you know, just, I think, like you said, it's just having the opportunity to get out there, to try something new, to learn something new. And um, I guess I'm curious because I think we encounter this sometimes with people coming out to try blind hockey for the first time. And I got to think it happens in the sport of goalball as well, where someone is a little bit reluctant or nervous or, you know, unsure themselves the first time they actually decide I'm going to go out and try this. So what advice would you have for, you know, anyone who's thinking about trying a new para sport, whether it be goalball, blind hockey or something else? I think it's important to to take it um, from the basics, like keep it simple. Um, so, for example, we'll throw someone right into a game um, situation, and they're still getting used to like the orientation of the court and goal ball, where the tape is, right? Um, and then say, so "Don't worry, the ball will come at you. It's not going to hurt." Well, as if they don't, they, there's no trust there yet, right? Mm -hmm. We haven't built up the basic skills, and we haven't um, really gained that trust yet. They're just like, well, you're the person in authority, so we're going to trust that that ball is not going to hurt, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's not really fair for people who are starting, especially if they're starting late in life, to learn these skills, right? Um, so I think it's important just to take it from the beginning and take it skill by skill. So just have them start throwing the ball so they get used to how the ball feels when they're in control of it. Mm -hmm. And, and um, maybe close their eyes, right? Promise they're going to close their eyes, right? Sure. Instead of wearing the eye shades. Um, something like that. I think it's really important. I was talking to two guys yesterday at, um, we had a, a, a picnic for our blind hockey team. So a few of us went out and just had a picnic in the park and, and they had said stories about goalball when I tried to show them goalball. And one of their big hangups was it was on the floor and the floor was dirty. Mm -hmm. So could I, could I have made that a better experience for them if I would have swept the floor before playing? Like who knows? Right. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I think that's important is just to be kind to ourselves when we're trying to learn new skills, but also as coaches and, and community people is just take people at where they're at, where they're coming into the, the, the activity and, and just don't keep correcting them and don't try to think that they're going to do the whole sandwich of the activity. They're just going to do the lettuce maybe or the bread, right? Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense when you break it down like that for sure. And, uh, 
pretty pretty cool that you know the Edmonton group decided to put on a bit of a picnic there and and uh, you know a little bit of, a, of an event to bring everyone together again and you know I think that maybe ties into uh, a potential answer for this question because I'm curious what you love most about being part of the Edmonton Seahawks blind hockey program well I, I guess I'm one of the only females, right? Um, so I get a whole dressing room to myself. Um, there, <laughs> there's actually a couple other females, like sometimes that come out and about. Um, but what I also like is the guys are really good. I've been playing with the Seahawks, like in two different eras of the Seahawks. Mm -hmm. And these guys are really, you know, nice and kind and, and they love to play and our volunteers really help me to develop. And so personally, I am getting a bit better and through the support of the Canadian blind hockey, I'm also get better. I go to camps and things and try to get better and better. So my personal development is the key part. I love hockey. I've always loved hockey. Um, and this gives me a chance to get off the street, stop playing shinny and really learn what I'm doing <laughs> on the ice. Yeah. So it's, it's been a fantastic opportunity. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. And it's, I mean, I think that, really speaks to the ultimate goal of Canadian blind hockey. I mean, obviously there's um, a thirst and hunger to grow the game and the sport at the, uh, you know, highest level possible and one day gain inclusion into the Paralympic games. But I think the ultimate goal and, and the, the, you know, underlying mission that's always there is just to get people on the ice, to have people that are blind or partially sighted, just present them with an opportunity to go out there. And, you know, whether it's someone who has aspirations to wear the Maple Leaf jersey one day and represent Canada, or whether it's someone who just wants to try a new sport and, you know, push their comfort zone a little bit, I think the fact that the programming is there and accessible is, is you know, exactly what we're always striving for. Carrie, I was wondering if there's maybe any special blind hockey memories or experiences that you could share, share with us from your time playing the sport. Well, one of my favorite memories, um, and it's not that long ago, um, is the summer training camp. Um, it was five, five days of hockey, hockey skills and different drills and some shinnies and mixing up the team so it's not as intense as, say, a tournament would be. And it was probably the first time since I retired from goalball that I was hydrated, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's a fantastic feeling if you've ever done it. And people are like, oh, yeah, it takes, you know, drink so much water a day. But it really does help health-wise and mental clarity to be hydrated. And so I think um, my favorite, favorite thing was, was to attend that and to just be um, an equal um, because I was around people who also had vision loss and to be expected to train and just to be involved and be active. Like it was just so cool and so normal. And then the feeling that I felt, I mean, I would attend another summer camp like anytime, like it was just fantastic personally and physically. Yeah. Yeah. Those, uh, those summer training camps, development camps are very unique and uh, rewarding experiences. I've been lucky to, uh, you know, volunteer and help coach at a couple. And for sure, I, I totally echo that sentiment. I think we're all looking forward to being able to host one of those camps again when it is safe to do so. And uh, because they are very, very special times. Speaking of special times, Carrie, I want to flash back to the London 2012 Paralympic Games because you made your return but this time you weren't competing you were actually a member of the media as you were a reporter with one of our presenting partners AMI so can you tell us a little bit about that experience and what what it was like for you to be there as media rather than as a competitor Oh my, you know more about me than I know about me. Uh, <laughs> it's just so many things. Yeah, I mean, the Paralympics is fantastic. London was a great opportunity, and I'm so happy that AMI, um, you know, chose me and Gary Steves to be part of that. Uh, we produced a daily show, so we always had to have product by the end of the night um, to air the next day, and it was the wrap-up of the day, daily highlights, if you want to call it from London. So we lived in London for three weeks and 
um, saw so many athletes and people at their peak and people, you know, in their time of letdown or what have you, like, it was, it was fantastic to be back in, into it. Um, I went to, I went to Athens just as a spectator. I went to um, Vancouver um, to support a friend. And I also, um, like 2012 was fantastic for me to be in London back in the summer games and just that realization and helping these athletes help them to you, you did your goal. I even was on a, a radio show and said, Canada just won another bronze medal in the pool. And they just kept going on script. And I was like, no, you didn't hear me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it was exciting, but uh, it was definitely lots of fun to work with AMI and the crew we had was, you know, just small, but, but good. You know, um, there's Darcy DeToni and lots of really great folks um, out of the UK were our producers and just really, uh, that was an experience. I don't know that that's ever been duplicated again because, but um, I think it really started that sweep to bring Paralympic games to, into people's homes because uh, it really still needs a lot of visibility. Um, different sports do, but so do the games in general. And, and that's just part of my passion is just ensuring that access and equity and people know what's going on, right? Yeah, it's, it's a great point because I think once people, you know, whether they're at a venue watching an event live or just participating by uh, viewing on television or online, I think having the awareness being included as you know experiencing it live in the moment that's so much the power of sport in general but then when you tune in and key in on paris sports and you understand the story of the competitor behind you know the action on the field or in the pool or whatever it's just an added layer of of emotion human interest of you know so much that just compels you to really get involved you know i i've never had the chance to cover uh, a paralympics or an olympic games or even a para pan am anything like that per se the closest thing i've you know experienced to something like that was when the invictus games were here in toronto in 2017 and that was such a, a eye-opening experience for me because you know i have covered uh, hockey events at an international level. I've done some traveling where you cover professional stuff, but um, that was the first time where I really was, as you mentioned, you're kind of in it for a couple of weeks and, and it's your main focus. And that for me was just such an enlightening experience. And I really do urge, you know, anyone to go out and experience a, a, an Invictus Games or a Paralympics or a Para Pan Am, whatever you can, because it is just such a powerful, powerful experience. I'll never forget when I covered the wheelchair tennis at the Invictus Games at Nathan Phillips Square. And there was a, a Brit and an Australian playing for the gold medal, I believe. And, you know, you've got thousands of people in this outdoor facility. Uh, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, just, you know, all these incredible notaries. Brian Williams there for CBC. And, you know, it's just... It's an it's an incredible energy, a tangible feeling. It's such a unique experience, and um, yeah, I, I can only imagine how cool that would have been for you in in 2012 to be a part of the media covering that those games in London. It was yeah, we and as you know, like we were the portable media, and so yeah. you're carrying your camera, you're carrying your gear, um, and then you go get the free food where all the, you know, where all the sets are for everybody else, right? Best part of being media, the food, no <laughs> question about it. <laughs> well, yeah. Carrie, as the Paralympic movement continues to grow, uh, I'm wondering if you can touch a little bit on the growth of the games and how things have changed over the time that, you know, you were involved back in, in Sydney 2000 and where things are now. Well, I think that where things are going is there is more um, – awareness of the Paralympic Games. Um, now we can walk down the street and people say, oh, you're a Paralympic, you know, they know us from whatever, um, they be at Paralympics um, compared to Olympics, right? We right. used to be called, um, lots of different sports are now entering um, in the in the ski and snow cross, like the snowboard kind of realm, which is kind of neat in the snow sports. And there's more sports, um, coming in the summer games and so that's really the important part when the when the community of paralympic uh sport grows 
um, then we know that we're doing a good job in promoting it. And um, also the number of athletes, Canada is always bringing more and more athletes and staff. And so that means that we are hitting those targets when it comes to our talent and our skill development. And that's exciting. Um, one area that I think we'd still need to develop on a lot is the funding for our Paralympic athletes. Um, and not just the ones that make top five in, in the world, but the ones that are coming along, right? Um, and talent identification is always a thing, but that's in any sport. But I think as people understand more that Paralympic sport and athletes with disabilities have um, the potential, they just need the resources a lot of times. Then um, that's where I think we can go, and I, I'm just really excited to always see the new sports that are being introduced. Well, and that's a perfect segue into what I wanted to ask you next, because um, you know we mentioned earlier that ultimately the goal of Canadian blind hockey is to provide programming for any blind or partially sighted Canadian. But in tandem with making sure the programs are always accessible for Canadians there's a real movement to grow at an elite level. And that includes getting the sport into the Paralympic games one day. So do you think that's an achievable goal? And what do you think it'll take to gain inclusion into a future Paralympic winter games? Well, I don't know the specific details about it now because I'm not as involved in it, but I do know that you need a certain number of countries that are actually engaged in programming. And I know that Canadian blind hockey is working to do that with various countries, right? Whether it's yeah. countries in Asia or Europe or Eastern Europe, I think it's really, um, that's the key is you got to have enough countries that play it on an active level and can, can force a team and compete. Um, I think what athletes need to do is train. Um, I know that when I was training, I created my own programs. I had to figure out the phasing of goal ball and, you know, how you eat properly. Like people, people and athletes have to really engage in their training. If they really want it, there's going to be sacrifice and there's got to be learning. We can't just say, well, so-and-so never showed me or I don't know. Right. Um, there's a lot of activation that has to happen. Um, for the athletes to get recognized as athletes that are at the elite level. Right? Um, there's no beer drinking nights or, you know, it, there's a definite split between recreation and competitive sport. Yeah. yeah and no I think, I think hockey is on its way. That's for sure. I mean, uh, we can enter to the para hockey. There's hockey for the deaf. There's sledge hockey. So here comes blind hockey. Watch out. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really well said. Um, Carrie, final question before we let you go. And again, we can't thank you enough. You've been so awesome here today. Um, but one of the things that I found so interesting about you is that you served as an honorary chair of Canadian Blind Hockey's national program partner, the CNIB Foundation. So can you tell us a little bit about that role and some of the work you've done with the CNIB Foundation? For sure. Um, it was a real honor to be chosen as the honorary chair for CNIB um, because they were going through a transition themselves when it came to like a name change to vision loss, rehabilitation, as well as um, introducing other things that people can do. So whether it was around employment or services, um, rehabilitation type services or recreation and act, act, active living. Um, so it was really great time for me to get out there and be in touch with people who were blind or had partial sight and just, what do you want? What do you need? And, know, and then inform them also, this is what CNIB is doing. And so it was a great opportunity for me um, to help them to get a feel for what people who, people with vision loss want in Canada, but also to echo that back the other way, what CNIB is actually doing to change. Because it's been around a very long time, and sometimes people don't know that this is different or these are the things that happen. Yeah. So, so that was a really um, fantastic thing for me, and I, I still am now on the board as an official board member. Um, so my my role as honorary is, is now work-related. I'm going to have to work on the board, which is fantastic because I still believe a lot in what they do and the support that they provide to the community, just like um, for Canadian blind hockey, like they've been a fantastic supporter. And I think that's part of that transition that people need to be aware of that um, CNIB was great and it's always done great things, but now they're stepping into the 21st century for helping people with vision loss. So. 
Well, it was great chatting with Carrie Anton from the Edmonton Seahawks. And Mark, it's really exciting to see the continued growth in terms of female participation in the sport of blind hockey. Uh, as a father who has a daughter, can you, you know, touch on the importance of growing, you know, and funding women in sports? It's essential. I mean, I go to my daughter, she plays hockey. She's a defense uh, defenseman like myself. And uh, it's awesome to see them out there playing. And I love the fact that there are more and more uh, females showing up to play blind ice hockey. And we're putting together a development camp uh, for that very soon. So it, it's amazing because it just, it makes it a more rounded sport. And what's important is that you make it a rounded sport and you make it inclusive because everybody's got great things to bring to the sport. Well, coming up next, we're going to chat with another goalball athlete. Stay tuned as we'll catch up with Bruno Hache. Hey everybody, I'm now excited to be joined by a four-time Paralympian in the sport of goalball, a former member of the Canadian National Blind Hockey Team, and a member of Le Bou de Montréal, Bruno Hache. Bruno, thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks, Nico, to receive me. Oh, it's a pleasure. We're excited to uh, chat with you, and we appreciate you uh, giving us your time because obviously you're a busy man, both training in sport and in life. And uh, I want to start with your experience at the Paralympics because you had the opportunity to represent Canada four times at the Paralympic Games in Athens 2004, Beijing 2008, London 2012, and in Rio 2016. Bruno, which of these Paralympic Games was the most memorable to you, and why? Everyone, it's uh, it's experience. Uh, only one experience each Paralympic. It's amazing to be there. It's the top of the compete you can go. And Athens is my first. Of course, it's like uh, amazing. The, the the venue. It's not the same. Like uh, usually, I'm a recue at that time, so I don't play much, but I got my chance to play and I score my first goal. And wow, the stands, it's, uh, it's amazing. But Rio, it's my best one because we almost beat the first, uh, the gold medalist of uh, Rio, it's Lithuania. And we lost the, the, the quarterfinal, the second overtime. It's 4-4 and we lost 5-4 at the second overtime and every team Lithuania beat like easy like seven goals between or nine goals mm -hmm. and it's looked like very easy each game and that game it's so amazing because that team they respect the other team but they just shake hands and look like very straight mm -hmm. and at that game at the end they just hug us and they jump over and we we so bad because we lost the game, but to see the respect they got for us, it's amazing. Hmm. That's my best one. That's definitely a very special moment and a very uh, cool example of sportsmanship with the gold medal winners and understanding how close, how maybe even lucky they were to beat a team like Canada and you being a part of that team. So I can understand why that's a special memory now obviously bruno you really love the sport of goalball you had a long career you've had to make personal sacrifice you've put a lot of dedication and training into it what is it that you love most about goalball uh, i i love prefer i'm gonna start to i learned hockey before i lost my vision at 18 and my sport is very hockey but I want to go higher sports, so high level. And Paralympic, the only uh, team got visual and parent blind, it's goal ball to go in Paralympic. So I choose to try goal ball. And I, I love that sport because we have all the same level. We have 10% vision of the low vision, and we have full blind. 
and I got five percent vision, so I'm in the middle. I'm B2. So on gold ball, you have at same level. You put the high shade, and you see nothing. So you need to learn how to uh, visual to to put your body in the, the good situation to throw the ball at the good spot, and you need to be accurate. So and you don't see nothing. So you develop some ability you not usually have when you uh, low vision but mm -hmm. for blind people they not develop fast like us because we can practice with no eye shape but the, the the between them on the court they have no difference and i love that sport because you you put so much energy like hockey it's a two 12 minutes period and it's never it's stop and go so you throw the ball you stop the ball you throw the ball so it's like hockey. It's stop and go. So. You know, it sounds like it's a very physical and um, intense sport, a lot of endurance. I'm curious, in a Paralympic year, what does your training regimen look like? But the, it's not the Paralympic year, but in the four years, we develop four years to go at Paralympics. So every year, it's five or six times per week. So almost every day i got something to do but i work full time and i need to train so usually it's 25 hour during a week you train but for me it's between 15 and 20 because i work full time and my job is physical so my training calculate that thing because we not want to over training too so i got musculation two time i got two practice of go ball each week and during my musculation, I touch a ball too. So four or five times per week, I touch the goal ball and cardio too. So, and I play hockey with that. So. Right, yeah. Active guy, that's for sure. Uh, in 2015, Bruno, maybe one of your career highlights when you won a bronze medal at the Para Pan Am Games in Toronto. What did it feel like for you to win a medal on Canadian soil and was that one of your career highlights? It, it's one of those for sure because it's in my country and it's the first time my family can see me on the high level because they always see me with the provincial team, but it's not the same when you represent your country, you live in the village, you don't see them and they come just see me at the compete. And the venue, like I say before, it's, it's not the same like in the gymnasium or in the school. It's a, a very huge and you, it, it's amazing. It's completely different, like usually, and it's good experience to, to have that. But it's not almost all, all uh, it's not just this one, my highlight. Right. It's, yeah, it's Rio and my highlight too, it's the, the first hockey, uh, blind hockey, the, the national team they, they built the first thing I got in and that's my highlight too. And we'll, we'll touch on your blind hockey career very shortly, but just to wrap up your goal ball experience at the Paralympics, I'm always curious because you hear wild stories about the village. So what was it like living in the village? Living in the village, you, you got everything. It's very uh, special and you have your own uh, place. You have your, Every country have the, if you have a big country like us, mm. almost you have the only one building for you. Mm. So all Canada it's in, you have your uh, hospital, you have physio there, you have all the community of Canada is there. So you, mm. you see the, every athlete too. And in the village, you, you can see everyone's too. And uh, the special thing for me, it's the cafeteria for 15,000 people. It's very huge. I love it, and my first time I saw that, it, I changed my face. <laughs> <laughs> as someone who likes to eat as well, I can imagine that would be a special room to walk into. <laughs> um, you know, I'm curious, Bruno, how does training for goalball help your training for blind hockey? But it, it's, look, each uh, training is specific, but for uh, goalball, it's it's all the body, so I train a lot my legs because I need to run quick to throw my ball because the speed of the ball, it's, it's weight three pounds 
and we can throw that ball at 70 km per hour. So you need very powerful in your legs and the strength of your high body, it's your core and your your hands is just, uh, you, you don't force so much with your bicep and your shoulder, but it's all your body. So in hockey, you train a lot your legs too and you have your ability with your hands. So it's a little bit, not the same, but it's close. So when I play hockey, it's my cardio. So I work my cardio there. So it, it's helped me th those uh, points for uh, the training. And sometimes I adjust, I tell my trainer, I got a tournament of hockey and I want to, to uh, compete. So she, she changed a little bit my training. Uh, that uh, that kind of fits the theme of today's episode as we talk to multi-sport athletes who have competed in Paralympic Games or World Championship level events. And interesting to hear about that uh, synergy in terms of the cross training and obviously Bruno saying that as well with the lower body uh, crossover between goalball and hockey. Now, Bruno, speaking of blind hockey, you mentioned one of your career highlights was when you were named to the first ever 2018 Canadian National Blind Hockey Team. It was a historic series, the first ever international blind ice hockey series in Pittsburgh where Team Canada defeated Team USA. How was that experience for you compared to other international experiences uh, with your experience in goalball? Uh, the, the very special thing, it's because I I wait for that for 20 years to have a blind hockey compete level. We we play for fun and I want the compete level because I'm a competitive guy. And for have this, just to have a team, I'm so proud. And they choose me, I'm in compete in goalball and they choose me, they don't know me and I don't know them, I don't... I know why they choose me because the Ibu Montreal know me and they saw me every week to play and talk about me. Mm -hmm. And when I be there, I go for a training camp. That's my very highlight. And I want to go back in the car at that time. Mm -hmm. I'm a, I come by plane and I, I come later because my flight is uh, late. And the teams, all the team wait for me when I come at the venue. That's amazing because I not, don't know them and they just yell and what's going on there? Why they do that? But it's a team spirit and at that moment I feel very great and the day after I'm like in the team right now because they do that and they, they believe and they know me more than I know them for sure. But after after that weekend, I know everyone and when we go for the game at that moment, it's a special moment. We go in the, the we we go in the, the I don't know the word, sorry. In the, the in the room mm -hmm. and they put all the jersey. In I the locker know. room, yeah. Yeah, in the locker room. Yeah. They put the jersey on every guy and mm. it's so amazing. We are in the Pittsburgh uh, room and mm. wow. We at that moment we win the series for sure. Because the power they give us, it's, wow. It was uh, it's certainly, I think every person who was there and every player you talked to that, as you mentioned, walked into the room in that moment, they testify how powerful it was and how it brought everyone together. And I think, like you said, it gave everyone a little more of an edge to make sure they got the job done and all the fine details. One of my favorite things about those jerseys is on the back above each player name is the provincial flag. And I, I thought that was such a cool, you know, such a small detail, but that would mean so much to each player because it reiterates you're playing for your hometown, your province, your country yeah, cool. and your families. Right. So very cool. Uh, you know, Bruno, I think you kind of already touched on it, but would that be your favorite blind hockey memory, just that experience in Pittsburgh? Yeah, for now, yes, but it's not done. The experience starts, so, and I want to go on the Paralympic for uh, the blind hockey. If I'm not there, I want to push to uh, 
the people believe we can do because when I go at that moment and we practice together and we make a team, we separate the Canada team and we make a game, I never see a speed game like this for blind hockey. And it's amazing. It's challenged me and I want to be better. And I'm sure everybody wants to be get better. And we're going to put that on Paralympic, of course. You know, I want to finish the interview with a thought about blind hockey in the Paralympics. But if you have a couple more seconds, I want to do a rapid fire with you, if that's okay. A quick little game. Yeah. Perfect. So uh, who is... The uh, the who eats more on the on that blind on that national team? Who ate the most out of all the teammates? In the gold ball? Uh, no, sorry, in the blind hockey team in Pittsburgh. In blind hockey, I don't know, but I'm close to the one. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I ask. I was wondering if anyone <laughs> ate more than you. <laughs> but I know now how to uh, to eat, so I yeah. I eat less than before. Okay. Uh, of all the Ibu, who is the fastest skater? Uh, me before, but um, we got a new one. It's a uh, Tama. Uh, Tama is very uh, speed. Speed. Yes, one. part of the national team right now, Toma Raymond, and uh, yes, he's very speedy out there. Uh, okay, who on the national team from Pittsburgh has the best wrist shot? Jason Yuwa and uh, Kelly Serbu. Oh, a tie. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. So. Uh, who Who is the best roommate to have? Goal ball or hockey? Um, I say Mario Caron. Okay. Why? I want you, you know that one. He, <laughs> he played for 35 years goal ball and I roommate with him uh, 10 years. Do you have any funny stories? Uh, yeah. He, he's, <laughs> he's wake up to go breakfast at one time in London, and I go, I go sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and after we go uh, visit at 10 o'clock uh, all day, we all visit uh, outside of the village, but it's after the compete. So. Uh, oh, that's good to hear it was after. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, last one. Who is the tougher coach? Coach Paul or Robert? I say Coach Paul. <laughs> I, I love Robert. I love Robert too. All right, Bruno. Lastly, because I know you've got, got to get going, but just to wrap things up, you talk about your love for sport and your experience at the Paralympics and how you want to see blind hockey there one day. Do you think that we're on the right path? And what do we need to do to ensure blind hockey gains inclusion to the Paralympic Winter Games? At that moment, we do a great job because the evolution we see last four years, it's not the, you can compare last years and two years before. And we got the, the World Federation now and all the worlds know us now and they, they start to develop. I hope they believe the same of the country we are. And if they believe like us and like USA too, we're going to have a Paralympic soon. Maybe 2026, 20, maybe it's too quick, but I hope it's 2026 and I believe it. Well, that was great to hear from Bruno Hache with a remarkable career in goalball. Mark, Bruno has attended four Paralympic Games. What do you think that says about him as an athlete? Well, he's an awesome competitor. I mean, I remember attending the Paralympics and then the World Championships. And to be at that level and to train and to keep focused – I mean, I only did it for a few years. He's done it for four <laughs> Paralympics experiences. I mean, that's awesome. So I, Bruno's a disciplined guy, a winner, and a true competitor. Oh, that's great stuff. Make sure you stay tuned. We'll be back with more of the show after this short break.
Well, fans, we've had a great show here today. We can't thank Mark Bentz enough for joining us on today's show as our co-host. Mark, what a fantastic time. Uh, Again, thanks for doing this. It just goes to show that an athlete is an athlete is an athlete. It doesn't matter what sport you're in. You take a certain mentality, you dedicate yourself, you have to prioritize certain things if you want to achieve your goals and get to the highest level of sport. And, uh, you know, it says something about all four of our guests, including yourself, who have been able to achieve that. So that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, you know, we've had some great blind hockey players who are in many cases even more exceptional competitors in other para sports. It shows a great depth about the blind hockey community. Um, but Mark, before we wrap up this week's episode, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. And I'm curious, what are your top three blind hockey memories? It's a good point. Um one for sure was, God, it had been a decade ago, we were in Quebec, and uh, when I had more vision, I was playing forward, and it was, um, we were down one, and we had like 10 seconds to go, and suddenly I was in the center, right in front of the net, the puck got to me on my stick, boom, top right hand corner, and the bell went off, like it was a second, and we tied it up, and I was just, I was blown away. That, that could have been the Stanley Cup for me. It was so exciting. Uh, so I remember that very well. Uh, second one, I really loved being with the team down in Pet- Pittsburgh. So I went as the massage therapist. And just to be with the national team, hanging out with just everybody, uh, helping them set everything up, Luca, Matt, you know, Paul, just, just all the guys, streetcar. And it was just fun to be part of that first ever event and of course you know the team won and so that was extremely special moment because again it goes back to that whole team experience and team value that I have so I absolutely cherish that moment and I think the third is just in general I love being in the changing room and just uh, shooting the um, I'm not sure if we swear in this thing but we'll just say shooting the whatever Uh, so enjoying the company of other people that share your same disability is an awesome experience. And when there's such great people, it just makes it it, it, every week. Like it's, it's my favorite day of the week. Fridays we go and we play hockey. So anytime I can hang out in the changing room and just chill with, uh, with the players, just love it. So I'd say those are my top three. Yeah, those are some pretty awesome memories. Uh, You know, Mark, again, you've had such an incredible uh, career within the sport of blind hockey, uh, wearing so many different hats, having so many different experiences. You've seen the growth of the sport over the past decade. Where do you hope the sport, specifically within Canada, continues to go over the next decade? Well, we definitely need to get out uh, to more kids. I mean, we've done such a great job over the last, wow, the, the growth just in the last three years has just been phenomenal. I mean, we got the GTA program. What an awesome uh, training program that is for young kids. So getting to more communities and getting more kids out, that ultimately is the foundation and, of course, the growth uh, of the sport. So spreading it out to more communities, uh, bigger cities, establishing uh, deeper roots for these kids and youth programs, uh, absolutely essential. And then broadening it out, broadening out the uh, adult programs. Uh, you know, we're doing great. So that, I see that the future, and, and the board is is doing an exceptional job of supporting that uh, vision. So the future is bright. Uh, Mark Benz, a former Paralympian, uh, a gold medalist in 1984, and a current member of the Canadian blind hockey community. Do you think we're getting closer every day to having the sport of blind hockey one day included at a Paralympic Winter Games? Most definitely. Most definitely. I would say it's realistic we're, we're in there in a decade. Uh, I mean, our European uh, exposure is just starting to take off. The boys were in Finland 
uh, we're doing a, an event in England, maybe not now with COVID shortly, but as soon as COVID uh, is gone, we've got some great foundational uh, experiences over in Europe, and it's only gonna take a few more teams. But I mean, the actual core of what we're doing is so strong that I don't see it being too long. So I've got my eyes on 10 years, but I'm certainly hoping, hoping for less, because uh, as I said earlier, sharing that experience uh, with our community is gonna be a beautiful moment. How about for you, Nico? You've been around a long time. What do you see? And you're involved in other sports. What, uh, what, do, you, what do you see the pathway being to? I believe it's within 10 or what are your thoughts? Yeah, you know, I, th I think you're pretty bang on there. I think 10 is definitely reasonable because I think if you look at the path to a sport being included in the Paralympic Games, there's certain benchmarks you need to hit just in terms of a, you know, international competition and, and a certain level of play. And I think you, in your answer, identified that whether it's traditional hockey nations like Finland or maybe less traditional thought of hockey nations like England, I think we're seeing a ton of interest across the globe. And I do think that, as you mentioned, once COVID kind of is eliminated and things return to, you know, the way they were, if we get back to that point, then you're going to see the growth globally escalate so fast. And I think the big advantage that blind hockey has over other adaptive forms of hockey that are maybe trying to get into Paralympic competition is that if you walk into a to a rink and you know like Madame Center where there's the glass barrier and you can't hear the sound of what's going on on the ice if you as a sighted person only get the visual you think that that's just a traditional hockey game players are standing up they're not on sleds the nets are a foot shorter but again you don't realize that upon first glance the puck is slightly larger, but again, you don't, you know, you have to watch for a little bit to kind of even realize that there are those adaptations. If you walk in and you don't hear the sound of the, the metal puck banging around, you think that it's just a really good high level hockey game. And I think the fact that blind hockey, you know, just on a immediate visual impact is the closest representation to able-bodied hockey. I think that is a massive advantage for the sport in terms of getting it into the Paralympics because you don't need, you know, again, outside of a special puck, a buzzer for the referees and nets that are modified by one foot, you don't need to spend an exorbitant amount of money on adaptive equipment and all sorts of, you know, um, special adaptations just to play the game. So I, I do think that, you know, with that and the rapid global growth that we're seeing, I do think that 10 years, if not sooner, is definitely an achievable target. And I do hope that, Mark, whenever we do get to that Paralympic level, that you and I are both there experiencing it firsthand, because uh, hearing you talk about your experiences as a 16-year-old in 1984 winning a Paralympic gold medal, uh, it, it kind of gave me goosebumps a little bit. And I got to think it would be a pretty special experience if, you know, whoever gets to be there the first time blind hockey is in the Paralympics. That, that'll be a pretty cool journey for sure. Looking forward to it. Absolutely. Well, Mark, you did a fantastic job on today's show. I can't thank you enough for being here with us this week and for being a great ambassador for the blind hockey community. Mark, I hope you had fun today. I loved it. Always, always a good time talking to you, Nico. Really enjoy it. If folks want to connect with you at all, whether it's with Electra Health or just, you know, learn more about you, your personal story, how can they do so? Uh, you can just go to markbents.com. I have uh, the website there and uh, that's the easiest place. You can email me from there and uh, that's it. Awesome. Well, Bensi, thank you so much for pitching in. This has been episode five of the Canadian Blind Hockey Podcast. Once again, a big thank you to Brian Bruno Carey and, of course, our co-host Mark Bentz for their contribution to this week's episode and the sport of blind hockey. Folks, thanks for tuning in to today's show. Remember to check out CanadianBlindHockey.com for all the latest and stay safe. We'll see you next time. Canadian
Blind Hockey programs are supported by AMI CNIB Foundation Daniel Family Foundation Electra Health Mannion Parasport TV